Hi everyone, my name's Daryl Payne, CEO of As Good As Gold Australia, and today once again I'm joined by my brother Brian, Thank you, partner at As Good As Gold. And today we chat with David Morgan, advisor to As Good As Gold Australia. Good morning, David. Good evening here and good morning. Yes, <laughs> yes. yes, good morning. And it's hot over there yeah. and it's cold, cold over here. here. Yeah. We're on opposites all the time, isn't it? Yep. But, uh, but yeah. we think the same way, that's yeah. the important that's thing. We're always on the same page. Yeah. yeah. David, busy over here, as I'm sure you are over in the US. And, and I think what's brought this about, I mean, is that what Brian and I are seeing more and more all the time are just grave concerns from clients about everything. Um, you know, I've never seen anything like this before, but this, their concerns are increasing dramatically. And that could be about, and I've got it listed here, it could be banking, um, government intervention, it could be their personal wealth at risk, their personal health, safety at risk, um, escalating to new levels. Um, I had a client in the other day, and I don't know if this is typical, it's happening all around the world, but they had purchased, placed orders on As Good As Gold Australia, some cash orders, three or four cash orders, uh, just under $5,000. And their bank, upon their return to get some more cash, asked what they, why they were needing this cash. And they said, well, we get a better deal when we, when we trade in cash. They said, oh, okay, um, but what are, you, what are you buying? Now, this is their money, you've got to keep this in mind, but they're asking them, what are you buying? And they said, well, Mainly furniture. We're just uh, doing a bit of work at home there, throwing out a bit of old furniture, bringing in some new stuff. And what they wanted before they were the bank, that is, before they would give them any more cash, was to see the receipts for the for the purchases they had made. I mean, this this is the extreme case that we're, we're, the cases we're experiencing in Australia now. It's out of sight, and you know, it's your money. And the bank's asking you these questions, making demands on you. Unbelievable. So that's what's happening in, typically in Australia at the moment. But what I thought I'd do, Brian and I have a great friend, uh, David, and you know this gentleman very well anyway, uh, Egon von Grayers. Egon has a way of putting things pen to paper, and there's hardly anyone in the world that presents, um, when you start talking about history, uh, global economics, he is the master in my opinion. Mm. But he he wrote an article the other day and he brought forward some incredibly valid points. And I thought what I would do is read them out as he presented because I probably wouldn't present anywhere near as well as he would. So I want to share this with yourself, David, and our viewers and see what how you respond to this. Egon says, and oh, by the way, for those who don't know, Egon is the CEO of Matterhorn Asset Management. They're the biggest private vaulting company in the world. He's a very, very, very smart man. And what he said was, there is a global collapse coming. It'll be like nothing ever seen before. It'll be featuring economic disintegration, war and riots. He goes on to say, the world economy and especially the political and economic situation today consists of a potpourri of lethal ingredients which will have dire consequences. Let's look at what this deadly potion consists of. Point one, debts at levels that can never be repaid. Sovereign, uh, corporate and private. Epic globic bubbles in stocks, bonds and property, all about ready to collapse. Major geopolitical conflicts with no desire for peace, major wars likely. Energy imbalances and shortages, mostly self-inflicted. Food shortages leading to major famine and civil unrest. Inflation leading to hyperinflation and global poverty. 
political and economic corruption in US, Europe, and most countries. No country will afford social security, medical, or pension payments. So what are governments about around the world going to do to solve these problems? Nothing, of course. The only thing they know is to print more money. They have never understood that a debt problem cannot be solved with more debt. All they can try to achieve is to pass the baton on to the next leader so it'll be their problem. This means that all political, economic and financial mismanagement of the past 50 years will result in a global collapse never seen before in, our, in history. David, I want your thoughts on those incredible comments uh, from Egon. Um, it's a very bleak picture, of course. Um, how close are we to this complete capitulation? Your thoughts? Okay, well, I'm on record. I was interviewed in uh, London a few years back, and at that time I said five years, so we're probably in year three of the five, and it is collapsing. Uh, what a lot of people don't seem to realize is how a collapse takes place. Um, most, at least from you know my conversations, think that like everything stops overnight and that's the collapse. And that's not how it goes. It's a gradual decline where you see you know less stuff on the shelves, harder to find work, um, mistrust of government, mistrust of the monetary system, and all these things combine. And so I'll start at the end of what Egon stated. My main concern from the beginning was that this will be the biggest reset, overused word, ever. Why? Because of the global population, at least from what we've been told, it's the largest it's ever been. And instead of being isolated to the Weimar Republic or Zimbabwe or Argentina, once the dollar is not trusted, doesn't mean it doesn't go, that it goes to absolute zero. But once it is not trusted, then there will be a run to gold and silver probably like we've never seen. And you'll see most of the things that he outlined. I mean, I'm not quite as, as gloomy as Egon, but I wouldn't really dispute anything he said. Uh, political uncertainty, we see that everywhere. War is already here. It's going to escalate most likely. Uh, social unrest, it will escalate. Food issues are getting uh, continually getting worse. Uh, water is something no one talks about, but that's an issue as well. And then basically a total mistrust of everything. I think, Daryl, you mentioned, uh, I'm not sure it was based on Egon's comments or not, but it was, you know, there's nothing in the authoritarian governments, regardless of whether they are proclaimed democracies or proclaimed socialists or proclaimed communists or proclaimed whatever. They all operate under a fiat money system. And on top of that, their institutions at large can't be trusted. You have a healthcare system that doesn't provide health, an education system that doesn't educate. Uh, down the line, every government agency you have a you know investigative body that investigates or plants evidence, and so this is the end of the age of empire. And the empire is the U.S. empire that's the dominating currency. And as it fails, you see all of these effects that Egon outlined, and I'm you know in agreement. I want to back up to your beginning comments, however, that were quite pertinent to a couple of issues. One is that you talked about these people that you knew that wanted to get cash and they got, you know, the what the heck for statements from their bank. And you made the statement, you know, well, it's their money. And that may be true in Australia because I'm not familiar with the Australian law. I am familiar with what's in North America, the U.S. in particular. And I did a, the only video I've really had that went really viral, I did with uh, Stansberry Research. It's got over 2 million views. In fact, it's actually the most widely watched video of Stansberry's research. And in that interview, all I talked about was the bail-ins. It's against the law in the United States to do another bailout. It's only going to be a bail-in. Now, that doesn't mean they're not going to print money to people who don't even want it or accept it anymore. But the provision is 
that it's not your money. The truth in the U.S. is that you are an unsecured creditor to the bank. So when you take your cash or deposit your check, the bank looks at it on their books as their asset. And they've got a liability to you, but the liability isn't necessarily the cash that you have deposited. The liability is that you're a creditor and you're unsecured. So if the bank were to fail, they could send you a nice email or phone call, recorded message or a letter and say, uh, as an unsecured creditor of our bank, you are now a stockholder in XYZ Bank. And uh, based on our earnings in the future, you'll be treated appropriately. Well, you've already been treated inappropriately because yeah. they took you know, your funds. Um, so I want to get that. The second part was uh, finding metal. Uh, I know the, both sides, the wholesale and the retail, pretty well. And you may or may not be aware of it, but I know that we have a different audience from as good as go Australia than I have on some of my other platforms. And thank you again for providing me uh, the opportunity to be on as good as go Australia. But we had a purchase, we meaning in the U.S. through uh, another uh, bullion dealer that you're probably familiar with of roughly $50 million. It was the mm -hmm. largest order that ever gone through at one time. It was divided up roughly 50-50. And it was 50-50, meaning half of the funds went to gold and roughly half of the funds went to silver. And the, it was tough to fill the order. Basically, <laughs> on the gold side, they had to go into Europe and get uh, basically some coins out of vaults to fill the order. And on the silver side, they delivered everything except, and I don't know how much, what was a small percentage that they're kind of on the hook for, for like four weeks out, which is probably past. But this is a person that actually asked this dealer to make it known publicly. And obviously, or stated that uh, this person is uh, in the billionaire class. And so 50 million to someone that has multiple billions, it's all a percentage, it's all relative, you know. Yeah. 50 million to this person may be what, you know, five bucks is to me. I'm not a billionaire. <laughs> Point <laughs> is that putting, let's say you have more than 10 billion and you follow, you know, what basically you and Brian have talked about. I don't know your exact percentage, mine varies. I say at least 10%. So if you got 10 billion and put 1 billion in the metals market and you do it in the retail side, I mean, that alone could move the market rather significant. And the reason is a billion dollars is only 1 20th of the silver market. However, 50% of the market in silver is already spoken for. That's industrial. Hmm. Another 25% is spoken for between jewelry and <clears throat> silverware. And another 10% or more is spoken for in solar, TV, photovoltaics. So how much of the pie is left? Mm -hmm. The answer is yeah, 10, 15%. Not so now if you look at what that number is versus that billion dollars, you start to capture my idea here that um, especially if that order was given, I wouldn't say at one time, I would say, you know, maybe do the 50 million every you know, every other month for two years or one year. Um, and the idea that someone of that significance as far as in the, in the monetary realm uh, has got the wherewithal to protect some of their assets with sound money uh, could leak into the consciousness of other billionaires and say, you know what? It's not a bad idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, strong point. Strong point. Um, we've we've had a few, uh, but that is a very big order, isn't it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't think... Uh, I haven't seen one in Australia of that size, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I believe there's more to come, Dave. The rumour is, I mean, I'll put a rumour, I'll say the word, uh, is that um, they're just getting started, that they really yes. do plan to put in, you know, 500 million or maybe even a billion into the metals markets. And if that is true remains to be determined again uh, you'll probably see a, a stair step you know with all of a sudden you got a new level that 
gold and silver will go below and then it jumps up again on the next purchase. And it wouldn't be a one-to-one correspondence, but the idea is correct. Mm. Yes. Mm. Well, just I'd like to hone a little bit, uh, just for a little bit on debt. What I find interesting at the moment, David, oh, it's always been there, but <laughs> the naming and blaming at the moment is, is extraordinary. And, you know, what's, what's caused this level of debt? It's, it's the war in Ukraine. It's supply chain issues. Um, it's a pandemic. But we all know that the world had a massive level of debt before the war, before the pandemic. And so they seem to be a pretty good excuse or are being used as a excuse at the moment for these increasing debt levels. Brian and I have sat down and we've expressed this to um, many people, is that a good business today should have a surplus. They should have reserves. And Peter Daniels always, our, our lifetime mentor, is always, ref- and he's a very successful businessman, yeah. You know, always reserves. Always have reserves. <laughs> now, if you do, when you're running a good business, you should pre- be preparing at all times for downturns in your industry, difficult times, so that you can draw on those occasions, you can draw from your reserves and continue to operate your business. What a lot of people don't realise is that Governments around the world never have surpluses. They only run on deficits. And whenever they have a bigger problem, or as a pandemic might be, or a war, all they do, and uh, Egon is correct, they just print some more of the stuff. So they just increase that level, that deficit level, and the debt just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So governments just cannot manage a big business and big it is big business that's what it is you know the economy in their country is big business and they're failing to manage it year after year after year after year Um, we need some seriously good business people in government today Uh, then we might be able to make some progress what what are your thoughts there well they concur with yours daryl But what I'd like to just add to is the debt problem. Um, Most believe that the United States was founded in 1776. I'll go along with that. That was 246 years ago. We could round it up to 250. It doesn't really matter. The point is that in those 246 years, the debt accumulated from the start to year 242 from that point. So it took 242 years to reach a certain debt level. And then the last four years, it's doubled. Now, I say that to, first of all, hopefully wake more people up that aren't protected with gold and silver, but also the fact that that's an exponential function. When you go from 242 years to accumulate this many trillions in debt, and then you double it in four years, you are accelerating the race to the bottom, the yeah. destruction of the currency war, the currency crisis, the whatever you want to call it. I don't think the dollar is ever going to happen. The thing about the dollar is it's going to be more and more mistrusted. And let's look at that for a moment because it has to do with the debt. The debt is they'll never pay it back. And if they do pay it back, they're going to hyperinflate the currency and they're going to give me stuff that I can't even use on my wall. You know, so. And that's maybe an exaggeration. But the idea is Russia and other countries are settling for oil outside of the U.S. dollar. Now, if you just go back a decade or so, and any country raised their hand and said, we're going to settle for oil with gold or with a different currency, those people had a short lifespan. (laughs) And now that's not the case. You have, you know, China, you have uh, the BRICS primarily that are able to settle uh, different foodstuffs, energy. Uh, and the sanction thing is the biggest backfire that's ever happened on the United States as far as yeah. I'm personally concerned. 
I mean, the sanctions are only hurting the U.S. I mean, it's made the ruble a lot stronger. <laughs> it's got a lot of people focused on what their balance sheet to GDP ratio looks like. It gets them focused on how long they've been uh, taking gold in as an asset. Uh, they even uh, announced that they were going to pay a certain level of gold internal to the country in Russia. And people misstood, misunderstood that as being uh, forever. It was a temporary thing that's already been removed, but it was giving a base to the gold ruble relationship. So there's a lot going on that is obvious looking backwards that many nation states are exiting the dollar in a subtle way. And of course, if there's a substitute for the dollar, and there is more than gold and silver, other currencies, of course, I'm favorable to you know, real money as being the ultimate. But nonetheless, if you're able to settle among nation states outside of the US dollar, that means there's less demand for dollars and less demand for dollars and less demand for dollars. At the same time, there's always that increasing demand because they printed so much. And everyone that's printed carries an interest rate on it. And that interest rate has to come from dollars that aren't printed yet, which means, as the late, great <clears throat> Mr. Russell used to say, print or die. Mm -hmm. So the forecast is easy. It's most likely that we will have a stagflation slash inflationary depression where that money becomes worth less and worth less and worth less. And then the run to gold will start at some point. And that's when the paper price of gold will accelerate. But it could be, and I say could, not would, potentially be at a point where people don't want to sell their gold. They only want to buy it. And maybe transactions in some instances are only are only made in physical metal. Uh, that's an extreme thought, I know. But when you have studied monetary history as long as I have, what you realize is once the trust is lost, you don't get it back. The only way that we, they, the banking elite, are really going to be able to get the system back where it's trusted is with some type of asset-backed currency could be gold and silver. I doubt silver will be put back in the monetary system. Gold likely will, but it could even be a basket of commodities. But it has to be something that people trust. And of course, that's not what they're going to do, uh, at least from what they've said. And I'll take them at their word. What they want is a central bank digital currency that is nothing more than a blip on a computer somewhere, which is basically how the system is right now. And you, again, are an unsecured creditor to their system. And not only is there no cash left, it's a cashless society based on digital currencies. They also have the ability to look at your social credit score. And if you've been a bad boy or girl and have said something anti-government or politically incorrect, or perhaps uh, the flavor of the week is anyone that wears blue on a certain day is, is <laughs> penalized. I'm being facetious, but not very much. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, you uh, you can your funds are there, but you just can't use it. Yeah, yeah. And it's very, very upsetting to me. Is you know, because the number one thing. I mean, if I had to wrap up, you know, my my quest, it's all about freedom. I mean, sound money is tied to freedom in such a strong way. And that's why I've been such an advocate for so long, and I want to see a sound money system on a global basis. But, you know, gold and silver won't do you too much good in a totalitarian structure where it's dictated to you how much you can spend or what you can spend it on. So you could be, you know, wealthy in real terms and yet not have the ability to do with it as you wish. And that's something that Harley Young never talks about, but I'm not afraid to do it. I'm not saying that is what's going to happen because there's always a free market. There's always what's called a black market and people are going to do what serves them best. However, we are seeing the extreme case of mass control through the monetary system. And it's very upsetting. Great. Yeah, very well put, David. And, um, I've got a, um, a list of a couple of questions as well. Not a list, but a couple of questions we'll talk about. Uh, Darren, I'm going to rearrange it so my 
question here is going to come up now and this question mm. at the top is yeah. going to come a bit later. Yeah. Because what we've just been talking about for our viewers is a fair bit of gloom and doom. But my second quick my second question is going to be a little bit more uplifting. And uh, so we'll make it the second question. But on the subject of debt, of that subject of debt, I've read a couple of pieces of information that come come from uh, uh, a couple of US sites. This headline that I came across goes like this. Consumer credit card debt hits all-time high 1.13 trillion. Now, this is only a few days ago. Is that good news, is it? No, I said I said the new de the <laughs> the debt or the gloom and doom comes first and then the good news comes. <laughs> you know? But I, about a week and a half ago, I came across another article, and this sort of backs this backs that statement up of credit card debt reaching 1.13 trillion all time high. 244 million new credit card signups in the last quarter in the United States. Now, I worked this out. I know the population roughly of the United States and I said, can't be 244. That's, that's more than half the population. But then I worked out the fact that, yeah, you've probably got half the population. Then you've got businesses also going into credit cards to actually pay the bills, right, to get that extra money through. Yep. So 244 million new credit card signups. David, is this a sign? <laughs> Is this a sign of a good economy when the debt of the world is unpayable? Just your quick thoughts on that one. Uh, of, no, of course not, Brian. We both know that. And <laughs> we're in a, you know, dire straits. I mean, we are in the end game. We're in the, the final innings. I mean, there's no way around it. I, you know, you asked me at the beginning how much longer. And, you know, three years ago, I said five years. And I'd be very surprised if we could go two more, three at the most where we don't have some type of realignment uh, either given to us by the power brokers or the world goes, as Egon said, where they don't have control, which is actually the more likely case in life. And it gets out of hand. And they'll, of course, do their best to put on a smiley face, just like, remember Baghdad Bob, you know, it's all under control. We're winning and the bombs are going off behind him <laughs> on live TV. One of those type of scenarios is more likely than not, uh, not the bomb so much as the idea that uh, the power elite strive through rhetoric and uh, puffery to maintain their posture that they still are in control and know what's going on and have it all at hand, which, of course, is opposite of what's really going to take place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the people need to um, get back to the basics, meaning what's real. You know, real money, real friends, real communication, real food. Uh, we've lost our way. I'm not speaking to Australians in particular or a United States citizen. I'm talking to most. And, you know, if you look at the Chinese, they're highly efficient, but they have a very dominant posture toward their population. And I've been to China. And, you know, not that I am any expert. I don't pretend to be. But... I gathered from talking face to face <clears throat> with many of the Chinese when I was there that they have a whole different attitude toward life than we do. They really don't see the sanctity of uh, human life like we do, uh, or in the free world, we'll call it. Australia has the same basic idea that you know a human is priceless and they have a soul and all these things. And I don't mean to be too esoteric here. I'm no, I'm a bit off topic, but my point being is that. If you have a different worldview, a different belief system, it's easier to control a population. You can have government as your God a lot easier if the majority of the population believes there is no God. So I'll leave it at that. Mm. Yeah. I um, Just to sum that question up or to sum the points up that we've made here, I think if we adopt the attitude that we must start thinking for ourselves and have less government, not more, because as soon as you ask the government, you are increasing government, the size of government. And if you increase the size of government, you increase the size of debt. So there's only one way forward, and that is to reduce the size of government. There's nothing wrong with that. You just don't ask the government. I, I love President Kennedy's ask. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. 
<laughs> God, we've gone the opposite way. Yeah, yeah. Great quote uh, at a time uh, when we were on a gold standard, by the way, as well. Dow, if you allow me to, I'll just go yeah. on to the next yeah, question yeah. here. Sure. Um, this is the uplifting part about it. Just another article I, I came across, and it's at, uh, actually a, an interview that Kitco has recently done. So this interview came from Kitco with an ex-member of Parliament of Canada. Um, I'd like to have your views, bear in mind the situation in Russia at the moment with its exports and the payment of their exports. So this gentleman says, gold will play a big role in the coming global monetary reset as US dollar loses its dominance. This is, to, uh, this is said by Maxime Bernier. Now, Maxime Bernier is a former Member of Parliament minister from 2006 to 2015 under Prime Minister Stephen Harper, said that excess money printing and rising federal debt burdens has led to high inflation in Canada. Canada now inflation rate stands at 8.1%. He goes on to say, a global monetary reset is inevitable as fiat currencies are being debased due to excess money printing. The US dollar will be dethroned as the dominant global reserve currency by currencies backed by a basket of, com of, commodities, uh, of commodities, including gold, according to Maxime Bernier, founder and leader of the People's Party of Canada. A commodity-backed money system will happen, he stated. And this is the good stuff. A commodity-backed money system will happen, he stated. I don't know when, but a fiat money system cannot live too much longer. And after many decades, with all this debt and money printing ac across America and Canada and Europe, it will have to end. So there are people out there that are moving in the opposite direction and being a member of parliament, uh, that's, that's a good sign. And uh, with reference to Russia, which the BRIC nations, just a few more extra comments on that, David. Uh, do you think uh, this member of parliament will will um, uh, will get back into power and uh, and push forward a, a gold standard if possible? Now that's a tough call. I mean, the idea obviously is has a lot of merit, and uh, whether or not they'll get back into power or not, I really couldn't say. I mean, I, what I know from the U.S. political scene is that. Anyone with sound money principles usually is pushed to the side. You look at what happened to Ron Paul. Um, there was a gentleman named Batnerick that I interviewed years ago as the libertarian candidate for president of the United States. And at my side was the late, great Harry Brown, B-R-O-W-N-E, who was the libertarian candidate for president uh, twice. And the basic premise on both of their platforms were sound money. I mean, there were other issues involved, but the main issue was freedom and sound money. They go hand in hand. And yet um, they didn't really gain any political power other than to you know, the Libertarian Party, which is extremely small. Uh, Ron Paul actually got more people to awaken than uh, Badnerick ever did, in my opinion. Uh, but the principles were the same. So uh, one, I, I would really love to see that. I think it is inevitable, though, whether or not this particular individual moves you know, ahead or not. I think the principles are the only thing that works. I'm going to digress for a minute here. This just came to my attention uh, today. And um, so let me digress a bit. I just got this book. Right, right. The Illusion of Money. It's a children's Great title. Book. It's uh, from the uh, Citizens for Sound Money. They did an interview with me about a month and a half ago. And he told me about this children's book about sound money. I mean, this is, should be required reading for everybody oh. on the planet. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, and it's a very quick read. I didn't time it. It probably took me 15 minutes to read the whole book. It's a children's book. But the principles are very key, and it's explained in such a great way that um, you can only come to one conclusion, that you can't get something for nothing. And government cannot provide something that they don't produce. And the productive capacity of the human experience is what makes wealth. It's not government. As you said, and I'm not saying we don't need a government. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that we do. But I do know if we have one, 
it's got to be minimal. We've got to leave the people free to create, to interact, to have free thinking, free speech. And that's the way you build a society that uh, really has, you know, the best life has to offer. So I really would like to add that I am seeing in my own work, the run to gold has started, even though you wouldn't know it by the price action. (laughs) <laughs> I'm getting more and more calls from these type of people that, you know, hey, David, I've never bought gold in my life. I've got X amount. I want it out of the bank. A lot of people understand or feel maybe that something is not only a miss, but it's short, the short time ahead. In other words, we're getting near the end and we are. So I just wanted to add that because a lot of Gold and silver bugs are so frustrated with the price action. And it's like, what's it ever going to do? Remember, if the monetary system collapsed overnight as a thought experiment and all the ATMs shut down and all the banks closed their doors and the only people with sound money were people that could trade, well, we'd set our own price, right? The free market would prevail. It's like, well, I got this cow and (laughs) you've got some gold. (laughs) Set your own price, right? That's the free market. I mean, what you buy a cow for in California might be different than what you buy a cow for in Melbourne. Mm. But nonetheless, both parties are going to have an agreement. So I know I'm going way off on a limb here, but the point I'm making is that people don't understand that they don't have to even accept the government's price. They, If you have something that's negotiable, it's negotiable. You know, I've done that in the past where, you know, I've asked uh People, if they would accept, you know, this shiny silver thing instead of this paper. And if they did so, could I negotiate the price? Of course, I can. And would they go along with it? Some do, some don't. I don't make a big habit of it. But my point being is that there is power in real money. There is power in the truth. And there is power in knowing what's coming. And a lot of people are waking up to what's coming. So I think the run to gold is going to accelerate. And, of course, that means silver will should and I believe will super accelerate. Yeah, look, even before before Daryl answer, uh, goes f- further into this, um, I just read this morning um, uh, before before I came into the office here um, that I mean we've all heard of Putin um, uh, making sure that he gets paid in rubles or gold and whatever, but he is moving forward. It was another article on Putin moving moving forward because the LBMA have cut him off. <laughs> So he got cut off from selling through the LBMA. So now he's talking to much more strongly with the other BRIC nations about having their own internal gold standard amongst the five nations as quick as possible. So another good move, Daryl. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Um, I want to refer, David, to just another comment um, made by the master, Egon von Graz. And he was making reference to... The UN Agenda 2030, the Sustainable Development Goals. And he goes on to say, this UN program supported by Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum was always going to fail. Starting in 2016, bureaucrats with no understanding of the real economy, and I'm reading it word for word, created this program signed by 194 nations. There are 17 admirable but unrealistic goals, like no poverty, zero hunger, good health, clean energy, climate action, etc. Today, almost halfway into the program, every single goal is hopelessly behind schedule, with no chance of achieving the target. How could anyone believe that 194 nations could jointly achieve these 17 goals when not not even one single country can do it? I mean, what an absolute waste of time, money, resources. It's almost like it's an absolutely deliberate attempt to send the world into bankruptcy. your thoughts, David? Well, I agree that, uh, you know, first of all, my first thought was, you know, you look at the leaders, 194 countries. 
And yet there is some head of that body when they had that discussion. And everyone followed and signed it because they wanted to be politically correct. They wanted to act. Who who doesn't want no hunger, no poverty? I mean, of course. But just by signing a piece of paper doesn't make it happen. (laughs) And the, the political class for a large part are undereducated on you know, business, money, education. And basically, they don't know much of anything except how to be popular and run for office. Now, there are some that really do have some merit. So I don't want to put them all into a broad brush statement, but I'll keep that broad brush statement because it's basically correct, probably at least 80%. So we are going to see nature take over, in my view, meaning they can sign any document they want. They can give any speech they want. They can make any mandate they want. But as this thing unravels further, and it is unraveling, we will see more and more self-responsibility foisted upon the people. It will be demanded of them. They won't have a choice because if you're out of, a certain commodity at the grocery store, you're going to have to do without or substitute. And people are very inventive and they're very good at working through these issues. If it weren't so, uh, the population would have died out long ago under any of these harsh conditions. And they don't. They continue on. Not that there aren't losses, but uh, the overall you know, human species survives it and moves on. Back on the um, positive side of things, I just ordered a new book tonight. I haven't received it yet. Uh, One of the discussion groups I'm in sent it to me, and it's called Radical Abundance, How a Revolution in Nanotechnology Will Change Civilization. Now, that's the title. I'm not saying it's true or false. I haven't read the book. I have no opinion on it whatsoever. But what I I am long-term optimistic. And one thing about the Austrian school, which I adhere to, is it's all based on basic economics, depending on either school, Keynesian or Austrian or classic, that there's scarcity. There's only so much oil. There's only so many minerals. There's only so much food you can grow. And is that the right model? And the answer is, I'm not sure anymore. And, you know, as an engineer, it's like, well, David, how can you say that? You know, you understand what's well, second off thermodynamics. I'm not trying to be cute here. I'll come back on, on point. But I think we have a bright future ahead of us. But we, I think the biggest problem that we don't discuss in the monetary sphere very much is what purportedly Einstein said. And purportedly Einstein said he feared the day where our technology exceeded our humanity. Right. And I think that's a good statement for us all to ponder because with these stupid phones, when I'm addicted to them, I admit it. And all this technology, look, I run an internet business. I mean, I'm pretty tech savvy and I depend on it greatly. I mean, I'll be honest, but yet has this technology really cut into our humanity? And I say, absolutely. Um, you know, when these kids are taking selfies and, you know, putting up this TikTok stuff and that's their life when it's all artificial. It's very sad. And again, I think nature has a way of kind of crushing these times and putting reality back in front of us where we have to deal with it. That's just my thinking on a philosophical level. Mm. 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 No, so, so true. Um, David, this is probably a very short answer question. Um, I'm going to, again, read out a little bit from uh, from what I read. It came from uh, the author of the article, Peter Book, it's Book Var. Mm. Uh, I think he's out of New York, but not quite sure. Um, read, read his piece, and this is what he said. While Home Depot, which is uh, in, uh, in Australia now, Home Depot would be equivalent to our Bunnings, but... While Home Depot had a better than expected top and bottom line, as well as the comps, I'm guessing that the reason why the stock is down is because the number of customer transactions fell 3% quarter by quarter, which offset the rise in the average ticket size. What he's saying is more product being sold, but less people buying. Also of note, 
While sales rose 6.5% year-on-year, merchandise inventories grew by 38%. Now, profits are profits up and stock price down. Now, I've run a business along with Daryl for many, many years. If sales rose 6.5% uh, for the year over, uh, over the last year, but inflation is running at 8%, maths tells me that you're heading into dangerous territory. So it's a question that, based on inflation, we are taught we, we are told that the stock market is fine and, and it's growing. But if you've got uh, a ten percent, eight to ten percent inflation rate, and your sales are only growing by six point five, you're in negative territory, and it won't last for much longer. What What are your thoughts, David? Well, I concur again with you, Brian, and a couple of thoughts. One is. Um, the late Jim Dines wrote several books, but one of his earlier books was called The Invisible Crash. And in the 70s and through the 80s, this is well before you know current times, the stock market started going up. It, it had a ceiling of 1,000 on the Dow Jones Industrial, as you can believe it. I'm that old to know it and live through it. But it started up. But what he said was, even though the numbers keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger, it's an invisible crash. Because if you look at the Dow Jones Industrial Average in terms of gold, it's going down, not up. And this is the thing about sound money that most people don't understand until the lesson is so obvious, it's too late for them to buy gold. I mean, it's my very considered opinion that when the run to gold starts, as I said earlier, a lot of people will probably be left out of the market. They won't be able to obtain it. It could become unobtainable. Now, I could be wrong. But the point is that the inflation lie catches up with everyone. And as Brian, as you outlined so well, what good does it do if your sales are 6% when inflation is 10? Or you know, the, the spread is what matters. And so if you can't get a real return on your money, then what good is it? And the answer is it's not good. We've got bad money throughout the entire system. And if we make more bad money, we're going to make it worse than it is already. And that's the only way out, unfortunately. They could basically put interest rates up much higher and maybe save the dollar. But I don't think the Fed's balance sheet could handle that kind of an increase like it could do in 1980 when the debt levels were far less than they are now. So I do see uh, what we've talked about already return to some type of sound money principles. And uh, we may not get there immediately. I'm sort of in the camp of uh, Jim Sinclair, Mr. Gold, where the power elite, the money masters, will try to go to a central bank digital currency cashless system, and it'll fail. And because of its failure, they'll have to put gold into the equation and restart, reset, reboot, and move on. We'll see. Yeah. Interesting times, no doubt. <laughs> Interesting times. Yeah, with all of this, before Daryl finishes off, uh, it reminds me of the quote from Mark Twain when he said, I'd rather the return of my money than the return on my on money. My money. <laughs> so beware of that, uh, audience. Uh, it's, uh, just make sure you get your money out. <laughs> all right, Daryl. Um, yeah, your, your reference to David to Jim Sinclair, uh, and we constantly refer to Jim. Um, and his uh, partner, of course, Bill Halter. But uh, Jim's comments about becoming your own central bank, and I hate using that word, central bank, <laughs> <laughs> but, but this is quite relevant and, it, and, yep. and it, it's an important point. Um, if it's good enough for central banks, all of them own gold, then yeah. why wouldn't we? Uh, it just makes so much sense. I mean, it gives your currency, well, it gives you, you, in their case, some value. What would happen tomorrow? What would happen tomorrow if they opened up Fort Knox and they found no gold inside? What would happen to the US dollar? No, it's over, isn't it? That's a great question, and it's yeah. a great thought experiment. And, you know, <laughs> I used to think it just, you know, gold would go up limit three days in a row. Yeah. But the older I get, the more I'm not so sure. And I say <laughs> it based on this. The population is so dumbed down. And so out of touch with reality that they would probably see some TikTok thing 
about uh, you know, there's no gold here <laughs> Just, and not move the market. I don't know. I, but I, my opinions changed uh, from what it was earlier. I, in fact, I interface on my Twitter account occasionally. I don't make a habit of it. I've got too, too much to do. And, you know, if people want to follow what I'm looking at. That's fine. And I do follow some others. But got a guy that wrote in and said, you know, how wrong I am that the paper money system is the greatest thing that ever happened. And, you know, I don't know what I'm talking about. So rather than getting a debate, because usually those type of uh, trollings, I don't even answer. But what I did was I went to U.S. dollar 1913 on images. And of course, I got a pretty good graph of going from 100 units down to about two. So obviously, as we all know, in the hard money camp, 98% of the value of dollar is gone. And so I just sent that picture to him. I didn't get a retort from that. But uh, all paper money has failed. This one is failing more and more. There's lots of indicators we've discussed throughout our time together today. And I'm just grateful that uh, we're able to do these type of things and get more and more people involved in a position where they can take their own responsibility and they uh, just have to take action. So anyone out there on the fence, you really should have some precious metals. It doesn't have to be your number one, you know, love of your life from now on. I mean, most people are too busy living their own lives to worry about the money problem. But when they see it coming, there's an easy solution. You have to have some. And that, I'll leave it at that. You don't have to go overboard, but you need some. And you're going to need it, I think, sooner than later. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Well, our great mentor, Peter Daniels, um, uh, educated us many years ago and has continued to do so. But um, his one of his very, very famous quotes, I do not care what poorly executed economic decisions are made in the world tonight, and there are plenty of them. <laughs> Tomorrow, I'll still be able to party because he owns gold and lots of it. And not only does he own gold, but so do all members of his family. Sons, daughters, grandchildren all own gold. So they've established a dynasty. Mm. Uh, as we would expect to do and intend to do with our family. Mm. Um, Egon von Graz, when asked the question, how much should I invest in gold? Oh, and we've talked about Egon a fair bit tonight. <laughs> we have talked about Egon. What's his response, Brian? Uh, the, uh, the response is always, bit, always the same, and that is if you uh, have uh, want to know how much to invest in gold, whatever you cannot afford to lose. Um, and um, it's, it's a subject, that, subject matter that we can talk about for ages, but um, if you're in the stock market, oh, you know, it's very wobbly at the moment. I'd be looking at uh, getting out of that to, for, to a fair degree because you might – be losing a lot in the very near future. So whatever you can't afford to lose, put into gold and silver. Thank you so much for, for your ongoing contribution, David. Uh, very much appreciated. We uh, appreciate everything you do for As Good As Gold Australia. Um, to our viewers and subscribers, thank you so much for continuing to support this channel. Uh, until next time, stay well, stay focused, and goodbye for now. Goodbye for now. Good night, David.